I once saw a race where, you know, first place finisher was obviously ecstatic. They won the race. Second place finisher was, you know, just pissed off, so angry and like upset that they didn't didn't win and they lost by just this small amount. Third place was even happier than the first place. And it was just like this ecstatic moment. And it was just like this whole, this realization that it is all about our mindset of like what we can accomplish because every single one of these people in this race has done, you know, has, has done exactly what you said. They started. In anything, bring the mindset of a pro and the attitude and humility of a final finisher. Now, Adam was sharing this with me off air. And uh, what does this mean? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, it's something I like to live by. And it's something I've learned from my experience with triathlon. Uh, as a triathlete, uh, it, and in triathlon, it's really the only place that this happens. But the first place finisher and the last place finisher are the happiest people on the course that day. The reason is, is because that first place finisher, obviously he's won the day or she's won the day. They've, they've brought, you know, their best result. They've beat the competition and they've, they've, gen they've shown the world that they are the best in the world on that day. The last place finisher has a different perspective, but is equally happy. And the reason behind that is because they have worked hard to overcome themselves. In many cases, they've overcome so such significant challenges and such significant uh, 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 things in their own lives to get to that finish line, that empowering finish line. And at one time in their lives, they believe that they could never, ever do that. But they have, have demonstrated that they could do something that 99.99999% of the world will never do. And because of that, they're within 0.00001% of the first place finisher. And, and that, that's a pretty powerful lesson. And, and what brings them to the finish line with that absolute you know, uh, uh, euphoria is this humility and this, this, just this gratitude and this attitude of, of, of joy that they bring to it. And so that's why I like to bring anything like that. You know, the first place finisher has this confidence, has this, has this uh, uh, mindset of, you know, I'm going to win. But, you know, if you can balance that with the humility and the attitude and everything like that, you're going to, you're going to bring the most out of every situation in your life. This reminds me so much of being in men's groups and dad's groups and the conversation comes up with like the tantrums and the tea thing and the no sleep and all this kind of stuff. And it's like, and I always look at any, any parent, right? If you're in a parent and you've got your kid to the point where they're sleeping, you know, I usually kind of like right around first grade is kind of like when kindergarten, first grade, so four five, six years old and you've made it and you're conscious and getting your sleep like that is an, in and of itself, it's an endurance race, yeah. right? Can you, can you, did you make it through? Uh, it was funny. The last time we met in person, I had uh, that day, I was, I had to, I was so much in caffeine that um, because I was within the first couple of weeks of my newborn. So uh, I probably put on a good show, but uh, I think if anybody uh, had been through that and knew what it was like having a new child, they were probably like, he's not sleeping. <laughs> so, <laughs> so true. That's crazy. Uh, what a frame, what a frame, how to, how to bring not only on the results of the, of the racers themselves, of the athletes themselves, but also of like how you're bringing that into the end The I, I think so much of how many people just don't ship, right? That's come from my mm -hmm. background. It's just like, are you shipping? Are you shipping? Are you shipping? Is it, is it getting out done? Done is better than, than perfect, right? Like, is it just 80% is right. good enough? Just go, go, go MVP, uh, especially in tech. Um, and that is such a great lesson that if you just ship, if you just start, you're doing more than most people ever accomplish in their life. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's, 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 uh, it's one of those perspectives too, where I, you know, I didn't mention anybody in the middle. Because the middle of the race is, is filled with people that, yeah, a lot of them are, are happy. They have that same perspective, but a lot of them are also disappointed because they didn't meet their goal for that day they're, or they're, they're upset or they just, you know, I once saw a race where, you know, first place finisher was obviously ecstatic. They won the race. Second place finisher was, you know, just pissed off, so angry and like upset that they didn't, didn't win and they lost by just this small amount. 
third place was even happier than the first place. And it was just like this ecstatic moment. And it was just like this whole, this realization that it is all about our mindset of like what we can accomplish because every single one of these people in this race has done, you know, has, has done exactly what you said. They started, they just, they, they took that first step and then the next consecutive step and then that next consecutive step to get them to a finish line. There's a lot of power behind that. So, yeah. The only, the only thing that I can think of from my personal experience, cause I don't, I don't race like that. I don't do marathons or anything like that is I think of martial arts cause I, I do TKD, you know, I'm, I'm working right now towards my first intermediate belt. I used to do Aikido back in the day, uh, TKD being Taekwondo. I'm, so I'm working towards basically in our school, hitting the point where we're starting to spar. And that's, it's a huge difference, right? You have to have some sort of technical proficiency, um, you know, getting used to get, taking a hit, that kind of stuff. So like the, the level's kind of going up and I'm, I'm working, I, I missed my testing last, last month. I'm working on the next step. And I think about, you know, the, a lot of it is time and proficiency. And that's the, mm -hmm. these are, you know, martial arts. And one of the reasons why I really suggest it for any feel good father is that it's, it is a commitment, martial arts for your kids and for yourself. It, it's measured in decades. Good. Like they're measured in decades. And so yeah. like, and I know for like athletes, like maybe you can talk a little about this, like your training regimen for that is not like Goggins just was on uh, modern wisdom. And he talked about how he did his first hundred, hundred mile. I think it was a yeah. hundred mile and he did no training and he like destroyed his body. So what, mm -hmm. what does it take? What, what's this training regimen look like? And in the context of like, we're talking like time, like, what does this look like? Yeah. So, uh, um, and interesting, you mentioned, uh, you know, uh, martial arts, cause I'd love to dig in on that too. Cause that's something my kids and I do now too. Um, but with regard to the, the, uh, endurance training, um, I do not go David Goggins. He, he and I have very different philosophies on, on, on how to, <laughs> how to approach it. But, uh, but ultimately there's many ways to skin a cat. <clears throat> whatever that means. But um, my approach is, is really this approach of, of, you know, you've heard about the, the turtle in the hair, the tortoise in the hair, the tortoise approach. When you're in that endurance race, it's really building that endurance engine, building that slow engine and doing it over time. Mm -hmm. So it is a, it is a time process and coming from a background of, of anxiety and, and like high amounts of fear, I know that I cannot, and I should not push myself way beyond my comfort zone. In fact, most people should not do that. You shouldn't, I mean, all of this talk about going like, you know, uh, you know, just going hard or going home or, or doing 110% is terrible advice for a lot of people like myself. Instead, it's like, you know, give 80% consistently and then get, you know, push, you know, maybe 5% beyond your comfort zone and grow it gradually. And then you become this confident, you know, courageous person that can really face anything over time. But it's about just that delayed gratification and uh, that consistent effort to to expand your comfort zone. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but kind of going along the same. Yeah, ones. I mean, yeah. Uh, I I was thinking about when you were saying the tortoise and hare. I was like, oh, I wonder if you're going to talk about mindset, and you absolutely did. I was like, oh, I, I bet, I bet this hare approach has nothing to do with training your body. Yeah, because there's like a, there's probably a, like. There's got to be in this, even the same way with martial arts, there, there's a regiment, like you follow the regiment, you get more flexible, you kick higher, like mm -hmm. you can take a better punch, you get more tough, you increase your awareness. But this, you know, this is the thing, like my, my mindset, my focus, what I think about, am I, when I step on the mat, you know, am I, is this going to be the best training day of my life? Yeah. You know, yeah. like is this it? And, and yesterday I went, actually went early. Cause I knew I was like, I had internal stuff and I was struggling and I was like, you know what? I need to go sit in an environment outside of my office and home and just reset. And so I went like 20 minutes early and I just sat on the mat and I just like, I zoned out. Cause I was like, I'm not like, if I would have driven right from home to the school, like I would have, I could have hurt it myself. And that's yeah. like, that's the consequence, right? Like I could have hurt myself or I could have hurt somebody yeah. else by, by being careless and distracted. And so I knew I was like, oh man, I got to make sure this is right. And then I, so right. I spent that time and just said, no, this has got to be right. I don't want to hurt anybody. I don't want to get hurt myself, I, but it's got to be the best day. Today's got to be the best day. So I'm, I'm, that's interesting. I love that. Yeah. 
Yeah. Anxiety and fear. So that this is interesting. So how does this manifest, you know, for feel good fathers, let's, how does this manifest for you? Because you're a triathlete athlete and you've got, you've got this pedigree that we talked about and all these other kind of jazz. So like walk us through this experience for you. Sure. Yeah. Well, I wasn't always an athlete or, or anything like that. I was, in fact, I was a terrible athlete. I, in, in high school, I played, you know, played in quotes, uh, baseball, uh, for a high school team that went 0 and 10 and I sat the bench the whole year. So that's, you know, kind of a description of how bad I was, but I, um, uh, so I wasn't much of an athlete and mainly growing up, I was, I was just an obsessive worrier during a time where we didn't talk about mental health. So anxiety disorder wasn't in our vernacular. It just wasn't something we talked about. And, uh, so I was never really diagnosed with that in my young age, but I, 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 I had this obsessive worry. I had this social anxiety. I was just afraid to talk to people. So I was kind of like the, the outside kid for most of my young life. Luckily in high school, I started finding my, 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 my tribe, the people that, you know, and they were nerds. So we were all nerds, but that was all good because it was like, it was safe. It was comfortable. And, um, like, um, but like, like nerd. Yeah. Like, like, yeah. <laughs> right. Like, yeah. Nerd? <laughs> yeah, okay. we, yeah, absolutely. It was just, right. it, I, and, and I, I guess I don't say like I was, I, I think it was, it was a legitimate and it was an authentic, you know, group of relationships that, that sure. I had and it was great. Um, so I found that, that, that tribe, but I, I just had this underlying and, and dormant fear that was constantly with me. <clears throat> like mm-hmm. I, I longed to play football or sports and like to wear the pads and be part of a team. But the second that I joined it, it was like this, this terror of being hit, you know, and those kinds of things. So, so that was, that was kind of my upbringing in, in, in a way. Then when I um, got to college, I started experiencing these significant panic attacks and I didn't know what they were. It was just this, this sense of like dread and, and, and well, panic that, you know, I was going to die and, um, and that I had some sort of disease that was going to kill me completely irrational, completely hypochondriacal. It was just this bizarre panic and and it had me floored and it completely debilitated me. It affected my grades. It affected all of that thing. And, and the one thing that would work for me was alcohol. That was the one thing that would immediately take away that anxiety. Mm. And, um, and so that became my crutch over the next decade. I descended into alcoholism that was blended in like periods of sobriety where I was just fully anxious and panicky and, and drinking heavily. Um, that's kind of how it manifested in my early years until I got sober, uh, which was the result of, of a rock bottom for me that, that was a, a DUI accident and, uh, something that I never thought that I would do that just completely, um, you know, shaped the foundation of, of this sense of, I completely lost control of my life. And mm-hmm. so that was the, the, uh, kind of the trigger point to, you know, make the dramatic change and, and my first attempt at sobriety. So getting sober, going through the steps of, of, of Alcoholics Anonymous, I was able to get sober and and find that framework of, of starting a new transformation in my life and, um, start to rise above fear in a way. Was, was this, uh, your family? So was your family in the picture during this time? Yes. Okay. What can you, are you, are you comfortable sharing sort of you know, what not and like kind of like the pain and everything that, that happened there. And then oh, kind absolutely. of, and I'd love to hear the other side of it. Cause I know that, you know, feel good father. And I'm recently, you know, I, I kind of just stopped pretty much cold Turkey last year, uh, in the, in Q4. Uh, so I've been, it's not that I'm, I'm not sober, but mm. I, I certainly, I don't even drink recreationally anymore. That's great. And, um, and so like, it's in my family. Like I have, I have NANA in my family, um, yeah. which is fine. And that's, you know, and so there's that kind of lesson, but I've just stopped because I, I determined that it wasn't something that served me. Um, but I would love to hear, and I think, and I think the feel good fathers are less interested in me and my story and they're more interested in you right now. And like, what was that like for you? Because feel good fathers out there, they might deal, be dealing with something sim- similar like this. They might be struggling with either the fear, the anxiety, they might be coping in some way that's unhealthy. 
I'd love mm -hmm. to hear sort of like what you were seeing and what that experience was and, and how you kind of came through it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I'll just say for, you know, some of the listeners benefit too, that, that your experience too of, 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 you know, abstaining from alcohol is just as powerful because, you know, what you realized, you know, well before I did was that, you know, that, that, that there's, you know, that it's in your family, you have these realizations that, you know, maybe it's not going to be good for me. It's not serving me. And that's a, that's a very valid and a very strong reason to stop. And I, I think that that's something that hopefully people can relate to before they get to the point where I did, which was, you know, I'm not ready or there's never a good time, you know, too much goes going on in my life. And then boom, you know, I, I caused this damage. And, um, and then so that, so as it relates to my family, um, yeah, I was, I was married at the time I met my wife when I was, uh, 19 years old. So she was 21. So obviously there was a good relationship there if you can do the math. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, uh, but yeah, so, so we were kind of codependent together on that, on that mm -hmm. path for the first years of our lives. And fortunately, you know, uh, when I was, when I was drinking heavily, um, in, in, you know, my early thirties, I had two very young kids and a wife. And obviously there was some, a lot of, you know, trauma in there, um, that was just psychological from the standpoint of, you know, my wife had to experience me and, you know, I wasn't an abusive father by any stretch of the means. I was still a, a, what I would call a good father. I was just not a very present father because of where I was right? Where, what I was, what I was doing in, in my life, it was, I was not happy in my environment. I was not happy in my job. I was not, um, I was not fulfilled. I was just full of fear and I was full of resentments. And, um, and, 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 and those were not directed at my family, which I felt was the one thing that was like actually kind of working in my life. But, uh, but certainly there were, there were times, you know, where, you know, my wife w was going to say, especially at the end where, where she was saying, I'm going to leave if this doesn't change. And uh, rightfully so. Um, and fortunately for me, that was not the reason I got sober. The reason was completely internal because I wanted it. And that's the differentiator is, is that if we're, if we're going to stop something or stop doing something that has become so entrenched in us because of somebody else, it will never work. I mean, and it so, just won't. Yeah. I, I just want to like, yeah, this is such a powerful moment, right? The the core of the feel good fatherhood, the feel good philosophy is right inside first, then outside. the The fact that it's sticking for you, right, and you're having this conversation and not relapsing and all that other kind of jazz is because it wasn't an external. It was the the video game terms, right? The psychological terms are it was an intrinsically motivated. It was an action that you're taking for the satisfaction of completing the action itself. It wasn't mm. the result you were looking for. It wasn't motivated by the end, the end there. You're not, you're not doing the triathlon race to come to get first. You're doing right. it to see where you can go to push yourself, right? That humility, the final finisher, you're doing right. it to make sure you complete the race. And that that's the power. Like, I love it now. Cause now we've connected. I love it. We've connected those two thoughts, right? Okay. Keep yeah. going, keep going. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And then, and so as that relates to kind of the fear, the anxiety that I was experiencing, I mean, obviously the anxiety just didn't go away the second I got sober, um, though having a community helped, like having people that I said, holy crap, this is actually a thing. There's, there's something called an anxiety disorder and people have this, this is affecting 40 million people. That was something I never had young in my young life. And, and so finally realizing that that's, that was an important, you know, milestone finding it finding a community of support in, um, in alcoholism was, was, was a helpful healing tool. And that led me to the understanding, which was really the next step in my evolution of anxiety, which is, you know, the first step was I was constantly fighting it, right? I was fighting it. <clears throat> pardon me. Um, I was fighting it where, where, um, you know, with, with alcohol, I was trying to subdue it, trying to suppress it, trying to run away from it. It was that flight, fight or flight response. And then when I got, when I got sober, I rose up to heal. I rose up to face that fear, that, that, that fear that I had and that anxiety and, and recognize that that wasn't fighting it anymore. It was simply acknowledging it and saying, I have this. Many people have this. It's a feeling and it's part of who I am. And it, it sucks from time to time, but it's, it's part of the human experience. So how can I live with it? That was the healing element. And then 
kind of moving that step forward, uh, you know, towards how I started to show up for my family and how I started to live. I was, I was starting to think, well, you know, how can I be the best for my family? And over that year of sobriety, you know, I wasn't really, I still wasn't really taking care of myself. Yes, I was sober, but I was smoking. I was eating like garbage and, and I wasn't taking good care of myself. So still, again, I wasn't, I wasn't feeling like I could be present for my family or myself or the best part of myself who I could become. So it got me thinking about like how I could change my or transform my physical self and, you know, really kind of start to empower myself a little bit more. And that's what led me down the path of triathlon and and doing Ironman was, was this ability to not just empower myself and do it from that intrinsic motivation, which was really, really powerful in me, but also demonstrate to, you know, my family or, you know, just set that example that, you know, we can achieve more than we thought possible. And so I started down that path and that was the path of taking that third step with, uh, with our relationship with fear, which is to rise up and actually embrace it. Look at it, not as a, uh, not, not as something to fear, like not look at fear as something to fear, but look at it as something that's a signal to us when there's either a danger or when there's an opportunity. It's either danger or an opportunity. If it's danger, we'll get away from it. If it's opportunity, well, then it's a then it's challenging you to actually push beyond that comfort zone just a little bit, not swan dive way over it like Goggins style necessarily, but just a little bit. I know I'm picking on David Goggins. I shouldn't. He's you know it's just it's different different strokes for different folks. You know. Well, I, I think you know the, um, I think one of the core elements that I you know on that particular topic is that we all have our own. Right. That, you know, uh, not everybody can be, not everybody can be one of the most elite warriors in the world with some of the best training in the world. Right. Right. Like that's what a seal is. Like they're, they're our best. There's, there's a handful more, but really they're our best and and not everybody can do that. And that's, they know it. We know it. (laughs) Like we know it in here. Like we know it in our heart. (laughs) So, and that's okay. And so the things that he's doing to, I think he calls it going to the lab. The things that he does to push himself to to get back in the suck, it's not it's not unlike a lot of the things that the Stoics do. A lot mm-hmm. of a lot of the really famous and wealthy Stoics would spend like I think it was Cato spends he would spend one day, he read about it, I, I spend one day homeless, sleep on the sleep on the floor, put on rags, like not don't get used to the present. Like it can it can all go away. Like that, oh, snap yeah. of a finger and it's gone. You yeah. Know? Uh, um, if you don't believe it, look at my history and look at all the game projects that I worked on that never shipped. <laughs> so <laughs> happens like that. Happens like that. That's true. Um, uh, so this is fantastic. You've, um, I'm really curious because you've said on a couple of occasions, presence is really important to you. I would really be interested in what was the, your state of presence and what did you think about it as you were going through your addiction? And then what were the sort of muscles and flexors that you used to be present? Because for the feel good father listening, this is about you because specifically in the terms that you're using, you're saying being present to my wife and being present to my kids, being present to my family. Mm-hmm. So let's, let's walk through this, your experience with presence. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, by the way, the reason I focus on it so much is because I fail at it all the time. And I, I, you know, I don't feel like I'm ever living up to the standards that I want to set for it. So it's always something that I'm striving to do, but I don't feel like I'm actually quite there. But, um, but yeah, when I was in my addiction, certainly addiction is, is really, you know, mired in this, this idea of, of self-absorption, you know, it, it's a lot of pain. It's a lot of trauma and, and it's, it's a lot of suffering, but it's still self-absorption. Like you're, you're, you're completely absorbed in self and that's where suffering lives. Right. Mm-hmm. So, so that's, that's really where, you know, my presence was like, well, I'm, I'm just such a piece of crap and I'm not, you know, adding anything to the world. So, but, and, and so how can I be present to my family? And that was really, you know, not, no, not serving them. So I wasn't really that present of an individual for my, for my kids and family. Um, fortunately, you know, they were, you know, my daughter, I think was three years old when I got sober, my son was one. And so they, they didn't, they didn't really know me at that point that well yet, even though that's a very, very 
important time, obviously, for that connection. Um, but fortunately, like their memories serve like of that time when I was actually trying to be present and trying to be there. And, um, you know, so, so I think kind of leading into that sobriety element, I think what presence really means to me, it's, it's, it's just being intentional about, about it and, and, and making sure that you're paying attention to it. Um, it doesn't have to be any kind of grand effort, but it shouldn't just be like this idea of, of, you know, I, I heard over this weekend, I was at a conference and, and there was a gentleman speaking who was, um, you know, high, higher achiever kind of guy. And he, he, he said something powerful. He just, and he said, you know, as much as you could hire out or, or pay or buy back some more of your time, that's probably the best investment you can make because you can, you can start to be more present. You don't, I mean, because presence is not doing the dishes while you're talking to your kids. It's not doing this. I mean, there's, there's, that's kind of superficial, but it really is just this sense of like sitting down, looking them in the eyes and, and being attentive to their, to their needs. Um, so I, 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 I do try and fail to do that as much as I, I can uh, amidst everything going on. But yeah. I love that practice. It's something I've, um, so in my background, there's a lot of like, not really neuroscience. I would say more like, um, like NLP stuff and not like the, yeah. the AI where like neuro linguistic programming. And, and really what I mean by that is that your brain likes a handful of things. So your brain really likes clean endings and clean, clean built beginnings. Your mm. brain really likes anchors. It likes emotional anchors and it likes physical anchors. This is why if there's a room, you have an emotional connection to a room. If there's a place, you have an emotional connection to a place. And so when you were saying that I was reflecting for myself about, Oh, you know, like, there's a handful of like everybody like the what's the uh the the story of the daddy's chair right dad's got the chair so that's where you can yeah. find dad kind of thing like i realized that i've built that and it's like oh i've got this i sit at my kitchen table and you know that's where my daughter does her homework and all that kind of jazz and so like it's a place where i i realize like i go and i make myself available and i just sit mm. there and i'm like okay well i have a handful of things like i got my remarkable for notes got any books I'm reading or my phone or something like that. And I'm just, I'm present. I'm there. I'm just like creating yeah. first. Like I got to create the environment first and then, then I can execute in the environment, but the environment first, then execute in the environment. That, that's really interesting. I love that. I like, yeah, I love that idea of, of, of being in the, the building the environment first and then executing in the environment. I love that. And just the idea of having this space where your family knows that that's where they could come to you for availability. That, that I, I really like that. I'd never heard that before. Great. So if you're, you know, if, if you're, if you want to put on muscle, right, you can try and build the, you know, if you want to tone and build muscle, right, you, you can try and build the motivation inside your body and try and yeah. beat up and, and beat your mind, or you can build a community, which is an environment and a place, mm -hmm. which is usually a gym and meet with people. You know, like this is, and it's that concept of the proximity. It's proximal, you know, it's the, this proximity of, you know, you're the, you're the sum of the five people you spend the most time with. Well, if you want to put on weight, find somebody who's got a body like, like yours and then be ready to put in 10 years, <laughs> you <know? Right>. like, <laughs> right. you'd be ready to put in the 10 years. Cause for the first couple of years, like I lifted weights for, I lifted weights alone in my basement for years and I made mm. zero gains. And then I hired a trainer for two years and I fundamentally changed my body, right? Yeah. Like expertise and availability and environment. It has a, it has a big impact, it has a huge yeah. impact. Um, you know, like tech development, at NASA versus tech development in Silicon Valley, just completely different environments, completely different, different ways of being completely different ways to develop software, stuff like that. Right. Okay. Yeah. So back to this presence, right? Um, You've got anxiety. Is is there any anything that's kind of anything to say about that, like for your family or um, about their reaction to you overcoming these things or, or their anxieties? Yeah, yeah. So um, anxiety is just a part of of our family. It's it's you know it exists. My you know my my wife has had anxiety. Um, my kids are definitely starting to show some of those those elements. Um, and, uh, you know, in particular, you know, um, one of my kids has developed a, an eating disorder around that, which includes OCD and, and some of those things, which is, um, um, 
you know, which is, which has been our, our, one of our bigger challenges over the last few years, certainly, you know, her biggest challenge. Um, and it's been, you know, that, that's been, I think one of the, um, you know, hardest things to deal with as a parent is, you know, watching your kids struggle through something and, and suffer through something, especially one that is, you know, as, as it is anorexia, bulimia, and those kinds of eating disorders have the highest mortality rate of any, uh, mental health issue. And so, um, you know, and that started for our daughter very young when she was 12 years old. And, uh, so fortunately it was one of those things where we knew about it earlier, early. And, um, and, and so we were able to kind of work into treatment, but we also realized that even in that process, there's not a lot known about that kind of stuff. There's not a lot, a lot of, of experience in treatment for that kind of thing, or really a lot of these mental health issues in general. And, um, so, so it's kind of a lot of, of, uh, uh, you know, does she fit the right criteria or do they fit, you know, uh, do they fit our, 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 our avatar for who we want to have in our facility or what have you. And and so it's just a lot of, it, it was a lot of frustration, a lot of challenge to actually find the treatment that we needed. Yeah. But what it came down to was, again, this sense of, of realizing that recovery really starts with a willingness. And I think one of the hardest things for us to grasp as parents was that intrinsic motivation, the desire for, you know, our kids to want to heal that has to come directly from them first. You know, we cannot force that on them, no matter how many treatment centers, no matter how many, this and that has to begin intrinsically motivated. So, yeah. Man, that is, <laughs> that is so, it's so funny. It's so funny that we just had this conversation because I just had a huge unlock for me. I was like, man, I've been, I've been tying these extrinsically motivating statements and directions as a parent on this pressure for my eldest, for yeah. my eldest daughter. And, you know, I, I said, you know, you get more proteins, more fruits and veggies and you, you could grow up tall or like you know, this, this healthiness. And I'm trying to like, Hey, do you think that eating in the style that you're eating right now, do you think it's the most healthy for you? And I'm probably just contributing to something that she's going to have to go to therapy for like in her thirties, <laughs> like, probably, yeah. which is, which is awful, you know? And, and I recognize that we have all this stuff, but this is such a tough, 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 tough thing for feel good fathers and for mothers and parents in general to just struggle with is how do we there's all this nonsense about how do you race? What do you do? All this other kind of jazz. And then like, but most of it just never really acknowledges that that's a person. It's yeah. A little, even when they're like six, even when they're young, there's a certain point where like, that's a person. You can't get them to do everything that you tell them to do. <laughs> like it just right. doesn't work that way. And so yeah. there's, there's a game and there's a constant game you're playing and the stakes are super high. Like you're saying, um, you had this, this process here for this anxiety, right? You had like fighting, subduing it, facing the fear, healing, presence and then like and then focus on like the intrinsic motivation for it is that something that you brought to to your your daughter and, and helped her with or yeah grad gradually i mean and and a, and a lot of that you know when that started it it was it was really the flip of a switch i mean like it, it could, like you were saying there there's no real it, it it wasn't like it before that we were we were thinking to ourselves oh we better prepare for this eventual eating disorder we're going to face and and that's I think one of the realizations that I've come to is you know you say saying that you you know your your kids may be in therapy later on, you know I I actually kind of come to the terms that for most of us as parents you know even if we're doing our absolute best we are in some way screwing up our kids mm -hmm. at all times I mean there's always something we're doing so I think the best thing and one of the things that I've learned in sobriety is that shame is a useless emotion like feeling shame. Um, it's just not a, not, not, not a purposeful emotion for us. And if we're feeling that as parents, you know, it's like, it's like, oh man, I should have said this differently because that wouldn't have led to this. Well, yeah, I, but that doesn't, you know, it, it's really how we're showing up right now. And for most kids, like, you know, for, I, I believe that things like eating disorders are equally epidemic as obesity. And, but, uh, uh, but they're still both very you know, they're, they're still both very, very problematic things in, in, in our, in our children. And they're dealt with in different ways. You know, for an eating disorder patient, it would be, 
well, you know, any food is medicine. So, you know, whether they're eating anything, it's, it's, it's just that that's good for them. But for, you know, for a child who might be battling the opposite end of the spectrum, well, a healthy, you know, a healthy diet and, and, and that kind of thing might be the, the medicine for them. But again, it's, it's, it's finding, knowing that ahead of time is hard to gauge. And uh, so we just do, we do our best to, to raise healthy children and just say like, you know, I love the Michael Pollan approach, which is like, you know, eat food, mostly plants, not too much. And I add one other element to it, not too little because of our personal experience. But uh, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. That's the, um, I love, there's a lot of large parts of uh, Japanese culture that I love. And mm -hmm. um, what I found is that usually in cultures outside of English, they have these great words. They just have terms that are just like encompassing and crazy. I, I found out about yeah. this crazy term that was, um, a German term. I don't, I don't even know what the term is. I, I don't really speak German, but it was a, it's a word that describes a migrant bird that can't migrate. So it's stuck wherever it is in the outside oh, wow. of the season. Like, it, you know, birds want to have a, a certain climate, a certain, not climate, they want to have a certain weather pattern, like a, a band of temperature and, and style of weather. And so they migrate to avoid that stuff. Like, you know, yeah. south for the cold it makes sense. Um, it's it's interesting that there's a term for that. So the term that we were that you were evoking for me was uh, it was from the uh, ikigai, uh, I, ikigai. Yeah, it's ikigai. I k i g a i. I apologize if you speak Japanese and I butchered that. Uh, just just go ahead and like and just make fun of me in the comments. It'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> so um, and they talk about eat eighty percent. And, and, and it's really funny because I am also right now addressing my diet. So I've gone from my habits where, um, I worked up, I worked really hard to get to shed 10 pounds mm -hmm. and then stuff happened. And I put the 10 pounds back right back on. And then I was like, okay. And I turned to my trainer and I said, help me fix. <laughs> <What's Yeah. going laughs> and a big piece of it was the quality of the food coming in. It was just really like for, for my journey, it was just going into, um, I think it was like half the plate was protein. Like that was just yeah. it. Like just a high protein fills you up. It's good quality. Like I'm eating like, and it's the quality of the protein too. So I don't have steak as much. I don't have hamburger. It's chicken and fish, like mm -hmm. chicken and fish, chicken and fish, you know, and that's, that's kind of it. And I think that that what's interesting about the example that we were just talking about eating too much or too little that they're both about the habit, they're mm -hmm. both about the habit, right? Um, what, what would you say, what would you say to a feel good father who, um, here's something that people don't know is that men and fathers have these kind of eating disorders just as much oh, absolutely. Um, as girls. Um, so what would you say to a feel good father as they're navigating the situation in their life? Yeah, I um I would say you're not alone, obviously. Um it's it's painful. It it there's no way around that. It's painful. You feel like you're on an island, you feel like there's no help, you feel like everything is is devoted to that and that you've lost your you know, your your livelihood while also you know, losing your sense of direction for your kids and you're, and you feel like you're losing your, your child, but there's always, always hope. Hold on to those moments of, of hope where everything is going well, because there will be those, those, those lights and have faith that at some point, I mean, and, and this is one of the things that we're continuing to have faith on and, and, you know, we're in a good time right now and we've had some very, very, very bad times in this process. Um, and, 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 and I'll just say that, that, that faith has brought us through on that faith that it will, it will get better. And, and ultimately that, you know, as, as you go through this treatment process, that, that, that at some point, you know, have faith that, that your child will come around to this idea that this is just, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired and they'll start to want things. Um, and I think that the goal is, is really for us as dads is to really put our egos aside. 
because we're going to get yelled at by our kids in in those instances. They're going to say things to us that we never thought that we would have never said to our fathers or, or dads that we would have been scared to say. They're going to say things that that are that are extremely hurtful. Don't take it personally. Remember to disassociate the mm-hmm. disease from the person and show up and love your kid constantly mm. and show them that you're there for them no matter what. Um, as painful as it gets. Thank you so much. Um, Adam, my friend, Adam, if folks want to get a hold of you, if they want to connect with you, where can they go? Yeah. So, uh, I'm on, I'm on all the socials. Um, my website is adamcliffordhill.com. That's right. I had to use my middle name in there, uh, which was a bummer, but Adam Hill is too common. So yeah, adamcliffordhill.com is, is where you could find me. All my social links are, are there. And, uh, and, and yeah, I have, uh, uh, and yeah, so you could find me there and see what I'm doing. Awesome. Adam Hill, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, and guess what? If, if that happened, the subscribe button, then also right about here, you're going to see the next video. It's right here. So YouTube has determined that this one is the next one that you should watch. It's going to be really good. You're going to love it. Lots of good information.